So we have the low-calorie, low-energy, low-fat diets versus low-carb, or in other words, low-insulin diets. And how do they compare? Now, in this case, if you're putting someone on a low-energy diet, given what I just explained to you before, if you restricted energy and you allowed insulin to stay high, that is incompatible, incompatible with life and the person's unconscious or dead. So what do you think happens? If you have a low-energy diet, what's going to happen to insulin? in order to ensure survival. Insulin will go down every time. So we have this massive confounding variable that has existed with every single low calorie, low fat diet. They say that they're testing the, the carbohydrate insulin model versus the energy model um, or, or the caloric theory of obesity, whatever they would call it. But there is this enormous confounding variable that is present in every one of these low calorie diets. Here's an example. This is maybe the most famous study. It was two years that looked at these three diets. Now, just to describe the diets, they had a low fat and then a slightly higher fat version, what they called the Mediterranean diet, which of course means whatever you want it to mean. Um, but interestingly, they were clamped calorie. They were calorie clamped. They said you must eat a lower calorie diet. So first of all, just think for a second. If you take the average person eating the standard American diet, or I could call it the global diet, because that's what it is, eating the standard global diet, which is about 70% um, carbohydrate and hypercaloric, and you force them into a low calorie diet, they're eating less of everything. They're even eating fewer carbs than they were before. So just as a reminder at how silly this is to try to use these kinds of studies to make these comparisons. Then they had the low carb diet, which was calorie unlimited, and it was Carb restricted. Now notice that it started at 20 grams and then partway through they increased it to 120 grams. That's a pretty substantial increase. Now throughout this study, looking at these three metrics, glucose, insulin, and insulin resistance, there was a consistent loser and a consistent winner, which is nice. And this is a heavily studied or cited paper. You can look it up. Now, they also looked at weight change. I'm just showing this um, as an interesting example of what would be happening to the shrinking of the fat cells. The low-fat diet had some drop. No surprise, they're cutting down energy. And remember, they're also cutting down everything that they were eating before they started the study. They're eating less of everything. Mediterranean diet had slightly better results. And then coming in for the win was the low-carb diet. But boy, what a drop and what a weird increase. What do you think happened at the point of that drop? I already gave you the hint. Yeah, the scientists were concerned about the rate of weight loss. They considered it to be too much. And so they increased the carbs in order to mitigate that weight loss, lest it become a confounding variable. That's, that's what the justification was, actually. Now, what happens to insulin to prove my point? No surprise that the low-carb diet experienced the greatest drop in insulin, insofar as carbs are the main spiker of insulin. And then the Mediterranean diet had a reduction that was more subtle. And then still the most subtle but still a significant drop was in the form of the low-fat diet itself. So every one of these diets was lowering insulin because if you just restrict the amount of food a person is eating, insulin will come down. So how can we really know that we've ever tested the endocrine theory of obesity or the caloric theory of obesity in these weight loss studies, and there's so much fervor in arguing about them when we have this massive confounding variable. So what my idea is, how can we account for the confounding variable? We need to forget about weight loss studies and look at weight gain studies. We need to put these same diets in a hypercaloric state and acknowledge the confounding variable of low energy leading to low insulin. So the reduction in insulin is going to be present among both interventional groups. So rather than just saying, how can we make someone lose the most weight? We should say, how can we see who gains the most weight? Which of these two diets is going to be the most resistant to weight gain? And which is going to be the most favorable to weight gain? We're flipping it all around. So we use the weight gain diet. And in this sense, I think we actually could understand the origins of obesity. After all, that's what we're trying to study, right? We're trying to understand the endocrine origins of obesity versus the caloric origins of obesity. Then why are we always using anti-obesity treatments? Why are we always doing weight loss studies? We need to do weight gain studies. And if you pay college students enough, you can get them to do anything. 
including gain 10 pounds or whatever it may be. Now, has this ever been done? To my knowledge, there has never been a large-scale study that has done this, and I have looked. There have been overfeeding studies before, but not that have separated into two groups, being low-fat versus low-carb hyperchloric. I've never seen it done except one study. It was an N of 1 which I appreciate greatly. I have long been saying we need more case studies to enter the realm of clinical research. I've long been an advocate of this. This was a perfect example because it's literally the only one I could find. This was an interesting set of experiments done by Sam Feltham in the UK, partly influenced by Dr. Eric Westman. So Sam clamped calories with a washout period between each of the diets, and he set it to, he had to eat 5,800 calories a day. That's where he set himself. And he did a low-fat version and a low-carb version with the macros split, as I show you here. So very heavily, roughly matching the global diet. So the global diet is around 65-ish percent carbs, up to 70 percent carb. Well, that's what he did. And the low-carb diet going really, really low-carb, but still these big calorie loads every day for, I think it was two weeks. And then he looked at two outcomes primarily, body weight and waist circumference which I appreciated the waist circumference because we all know body weight is more than just body fat. So the first, in the first case, when he was on the hypercaloric low-fat diet, he saw that his body weight went up by 7 kilos. That's pretty hefty. And on the low-carb diet, it only went up by a little over a kilo, so a pretty substantial change in weight gain. And he would always get back to baseline before he started the next round. Then he looked at waist circumference. He found that on the low-fat hypercaloric diet, his waist circumference went up by 9 centimeters. That's a nice, once again, increase. That's another couple notches in the belt. And then on the low-carb diet, his waist circumference went down by 3 centimeters compared to getting back to baseline. This is how we need to do it. If we want to understand why fat cells grow and shrink, if we're only ever forcing them to shrink, we always have the confounding variable of low insulin because insulin is the hormone of the fed state. And if we are feeding less, it's no surprise that insulin must come down and that will always be a confounding variable. 